Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your spicy host, Tara Rose, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under-discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I would love for you to give me a follow. This particular show is all about unlocking the secrets to a more fulfilling and empowered, pleasurable sex life. And today, we're diving into a topic that has the potential to transform your intimate experiences, embodied consent. We have an incredible guest with us today, Katie Spatero a certified somatic sex educator, sexological body worker, and a true expert when it comes to this particular topic. Now, you might be wondering, what does embodied consent have to do with intimacy, more pleasure, and getting the erotic experiences you crave? The answer, everything. It's about being mindful, intentional, and fully present when it comes to giving and receiving. In this episode, we'll explore how understanding the nuances of embodied consent can be a total game changer in your role as a lover. Embodied consent has been incredibly powerful in our lives, and we can't wait to share this wisdom with you. Get ready to open your mind and learn more about what embodied consent can do for you. In the spirit of reconciliation, I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge I'm recording this show on the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of the Treaty 7 region and Métis Nation, Alberta, Region 3. Before we dive into this world of embodied consent, let's take a moment to tune into our body's wisdom. If you'd like to participate in our somatic inquiry for this episode, you can just continue listening. And if you don't want to, I encourage you to fast forward and listen to what your body wants. So taking a moment to find a comfortable and relaxed position, could be sitting or standing. And if it feels right to you, perhaps closing your eyes. Taking a few breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Noticing the soothing rhythm of your breath. The gentle rise and fall of your chest and abdomen. As you continue to breathe, bringing your awareness inward into your body. Paying attention to how your body is positioned in this space. Are your feet grounded on the floor? Is your bum sitting in a chair, on a carpet or a rug? How is your body supported? Now taking a moment to consider this. What is something you want to say yes to? What does this yes feel like in your body? Is there a sensation, a lightness, a warmth, or is there something else? Spend a moment here in your yes. Noticing what you notice. Now, let's move over to a no. What is something you want to say no to? What do you notice in your body? Do you notice a contraction? perhaps a heaviness, a distinct feeling. Spend a moment here in your no, noticing what you notice. Remember, there is no right or wrong answers here. 
It's about connecting with your body and its wisdom. Perhaps taking a few gentle breaths here and when you're ready, slowly opening your eyes, they were closed. And let's embark on this journey of embodied consent where your body's yes and no hold incredible power. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for that embodiment practice. That was really lovely. Aw, thank you. What did you notice when you were sitting there listening? Uh, I noticed that this is a practice that I do quite often with myself, with my clients. And I noticed that I, I loved how you were guiding. I love the pacing that you were guiding. It was just for me, just the right amount of pace to both notice my body and then also not to keep it moving. So I didn't like loop into story about why is that my yes or why is that my no, just to feel it. Mm -hmm. So I appreciated that inquiry. Mm, great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that too. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. I did a little mini intro, but is there anything that you feel I may have missed or that you might want to share? Sure. I'll just again say I'm Katie Spataro. Uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm located on the unceded land of the Duwamish people, otherwise known as Seattle, Washington, in the northwest of the U.S. And it feels important to name that if, as we get into conversation and inquiry around embodied consent, that this acknowledging the land that I'm on as a colonial, that, you know, as a white person teaching about and exploring consent in my body, my own body and in my relationships with others, that my deepest wish is that it is in service to repair and right relationship with the world around us and around me and in relationship to the land and to the earth. So I want to maybe just start there as we begin to talk about and get up to some exploration of embodied consent. Wow. Thank you. You worded that so beautifully that like touched my heart. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a little bit of the why. Yeah. Because some of the why is like better relationships and better sex. And there's also a bigger, for me, there's a bigger why too, that, that those big, better relationships and better sex don't happen in a vacuum. They happen also in relationship to how we are in the world around us and how we feel in the world around us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Embodied consent isn't just about sex and intimacy. It's about your career. That's right. It's about your friends. It's about your family. That's Right. Yeah, I think it's also about the decisions we make in, you know, like how we live. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe are, and some people might be really new to this term embodied consent. Mm -hmm. So maybe are you able to like, do a quick explanation of what it is? <laughs> maybe to folks who are listening who are like, what is this concept? Mm hmm. I know it's hard to like wrap up into a few seconds. Yeah, I think I'm good. Before I dive into that, I feel like I want to actually acknowledge like where my learning and training has been in this realm and that it's that there's so much more than just I know and can offer right around embodied consent. So we're going to talk about embodied consent today through my lens and through our lens as somatic sex educators. And there's so much more right than this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes. So this is like one lens and one's way of experiencing and practicing embodied consent. So I'm a somatic sex educator and a colleague with you, Tara, and I also am a teacher of this modality at the Institute for the Study of Somatic Sex Education. And my training through that has been through the modality of what's called the wheel of consent. This is a practice developed by my teacher, Dr. Betty Martin, who runs the School of Consent, where I also teach classes on the Wheel of Consent. And I work individually with clients and people in relationship constellations, and I also teach the Wheel of Consent to sex therapists. So I really come from 
some study and practice around this particularly philosophy and practice of embodied consent through the wheel of consent. I know we're going to talk about the wheel, of course, but you know, what is embodied consent? One way I think of embodied consent is cultivating the alignment between what our body is saying and what our mind is saying in any given choice that we might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, our world is constantly full of choices. And there are lots of places where we don't have choice. Yeah. Actually, one thing Dr. Betty Martin mentions is the choosing is more important than the doing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And and celebrating where, you know, our no's is a, are as sexy as our yeses, right? And getting to have choice and to, to recognize that there is choice and that we can practice that deep listening, that inquiry that you guided us in, like what does yes feel like and what does no feel like? We can practice being in greater choice and greater alignment by listen, by the awareness of our bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when it comes to working with an SSE or a sex bod worker, that's literally what we practice. Mm-hmm. Every session is mm-hmm. choosing, noticing, what is it? Notice, trust, value, acknowledge. Mm-hmm. communicate. That's I don't right. know if I said it in the right mm-hmm. order, but I remember that from the training that I did. Yeah. In other words, we're going to notice first what our body is letting us know, mm-hmm. but we're also going to trust what, what we're noticing and value it enough to actually then communicate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one important aspect that I learned in the like a pro was direct pleasure versus indirect pleasure routes. And most clients or people that I share this experience with, we do waking up the hands, their minds are just blown when they actually can see and embody the difference between the two, knowing that for most of their lives, they may have been stuck in the indirect pleasure route. And opening up to what the direct pleasure route is completely like is mind boggling to them. Would you be able to kind of explain? I know it's hard without an embodied sense of what it is, but explain kind of the difference between the two. Sure. Well, um, you mentioned this practice, waking up the hands. And for folks that don't know, this practice is done by using our hands to feel an object. And the reason we use our hands is that because next to our lips and our genitals, our hands have some of the most nerve endings and nerve dense, nerve rich areas in our body. So there's the opportunity for incredible amount of sensation available in our hands and other places on the body too, but the hands can be someplace that could be really uh, valuable to begin with a practice. And using our hands to feel taking in direct sensation through our skin and noticing what feels good, like using different parts of our hands to find sensation that feels, you know, comforting or pleasant or pleasurable. And we don't know if this is not a practice. This is not something we do typically in our daily lives. So it's like a practice that brings us out of maybe habitual patterns of using our hands to wash the dishes, put on our children's clothes, give our partner a massage, right? Like we do so much things with our hands, but it's not often that we'll do things with our hands that's about bringing ourselves pleasure, right? Intentionally. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I love this practice, waking the hands. It's a really a core practice of embodied consent. Mm -hmm. And it's a practice in this what we call the direct route of pleasure which is using our own bodies to take in that sensation through our skin different than say using our bodies or using our hands to reach out and touch somebody else for their pleasure this is also really fabulous but we think we call this the indirect route because it's a way we can also use our hands and to give somebody else pleasure and of course Sometimes that brings us delight. We might call that the indirect route of access to pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that can really 
transform how you touch somebody? Like, who is it for? Is it for you to notice the pleasure and take that pleasure through your hands? Or is that for you to give pleasure and give what that person is desiring or wanting or requesting? Right. And of course, both are fabulous, but to really have an understanding, you know, part of consent is to know what is happening and who it's for, right? That's the contribution of the wheel of consent. What are we doing and and who is it for? And, and sometimes it can be for both folks, but to, but to be really clear about that actually opens up so many more possibilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I often give like an example when I'm explaining this to clients of, you know, two people together, lovers, partners, one partner isn't like they don't get anything from oral sex. They're like, eh, whatever. I could go without it. It's not a necessity in my sex life with my lover. Whereas the other person like loves to do it. Like they get turned on doing it. And so the person who loves to do it is doing it to the other partner and they think they're giving the gift Mm -hmm. because they're doing the action. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other partner is like, I'm giving the gift because I'm allowing access to my body. And so like nobody is receiving the gift. And that's usually when I see the light bulbs start to come on people like, oh my God, I've been in this position before. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that we could describe so many of those kind of scenarios that are right common in sex and intimacy you know in general where everyone thinks they're doing something for the other person and then you know what I see in my practice and in my personal life is you know often there's like resentment you know people aren't satisfied they're not getting the depth and level of intimacy and connection that they're wanting right because everyone is in giving and no one is actually in receiving yeah and that's just where I find so much power in teaching the wheel of consent to people that I'm working with, especially couples. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and traditional models or way of, of teaching or understanding consent is just about like what you're giving permission for or what you're okay with. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. Or yeah, you can do that to me. Right. And, and I think, you know, now the conversation is so much more about actually being in communication and and noticing what is it that I really want not what I'm okay with or you know what somebody could do to me like what does I want for me and that inherently puts me in that role of receiving right Mm -hmm. I think embodied consent practice is also about getting very nuanced that being and receiving is not about adapting myself to be okay with something that doesn't actually feel good But embodied consent is listening to my body's yes in the moment and learning how to stay with that and communicate it and follow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I wrote down here is you don't give consent, you arrive at consent together. Mm, I love that. Right? Yeah. (laughs) And that definitely can impact on being, I don't want to say better lover, but like more in tune with yourself and with your partner it just creates an atmosphere for more incredible intimacy it's so true yeah it's so true yeah and there is a difference between giving a request offering and then inviting Mm -hmm. and that was actually like mind-blowing to me when we were when I was taking this in in school and I'm curious how this might play into intimate relationships and why it matters to know the difference between a request and offer and an invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To me, that's pretty much the essence of, of what makes a really powerful. And I mean, the potential for a satisfying and the kind of experience most people are often wanting with sex, which is, you know, making a request is asking for something that I want for myself. When I make a request, it's something I want for me. And when I make an offer, it's something I'm, I'm saying, is this something you would like for you? And those are very different things. 
in essence, it gives us the opportunity to play in those roles of giving, receiving, and being clear about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember, believe it was Coco. And she said, she gave the example of like a party request. Would you come to this party? Will you come to this party with me? Mm -hmm. An offer is, there's a party I'm going to. Is this something you want to come to with me? And then an invitation is, let's go to this party together. Did mm -hmm. I get that right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> okay. if you have an invitation might be is something like, this is something I want for me. If this is something you want for you too, come along, right? Yeah. Yeah. In other words, it's an opportunity for us to play in that realm where it can be really for both of us. Yeah. And I there's something I wanted to touch on because this keeps coming up a bit. With my clients, I come from the lineage of non-monogamy. And there was a point in my life where I was starting to just say yes to everything and not really acknowledging the no, especially when it came to being with other people or other lovers or at events, doing things that maybe were a no, but I was kind of overriding because I felt like, well, I'm a recovering people pleaser. So that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed the more that I did that, as we were getting ready for events or to go out or to go on a date with somebody, like the anxiety in my body was real. Like I would yeah. feel nauseous. I would have panic attacks. It, it was awful. Like it felt debilitating to the point where sometimes I couldn't go out. And that was really my body protecting me yeah yeah <laughs> it was your no it was my no not being acknowledged and my body's like I don't want you to put me in that position again so I'm going to do everything I can to prevent you from going to these events or whatever it was yeah beautiful and that happens to people not just in the lifestyle but you know dating or with a lover even you know you're saying yes to things when really it might be a no or something that you'd need to negotiate a little bit further. And that's why I have people or couples coming to me like, this isn't what it used to be. And I'm like, well, we need to bring it back and mm -hmm. start to notice this and practice it and find that safety in your body again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you began to notice that and recognize that that anxiety was had had a lot of really wise information for you, right? It was about protecting. And um, like, sometimes we just ignore those six, six signals for a while until we sometimes can't ignore them anymore. Yeah. Right. That's basically, I had no choice. Okay. Yeah, I had to. <laughs> and then COVID hit and then I enrolled in the Institute and I'm like, oh, Perfect. light bulbs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Well, yeah. and I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the real and valid reasons why no might not be available. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, there's, I know some of us might, I put myself in this category, were enculturated to, to not have a no, right? Or that no wasn't welcome. You know, as a femme, it's like, yeah, you're yes. You know, that's what you're supposed to do. You say yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Meaning it's also always, you know, I, as somebody raised Catholic, I don't know that this was ever spoken explicitly, but it was incredibly implied by all the women that I saw in my family that our role was be in service to the, the man in the equation. And so the pleasure was not ever for me as a woman, it was for the other person. And so like that, I feels like enculturated on such a cellular level that I, I think I had to learn that I was allowed to have a no. Right. So, and sometimes not ha having access to no could be about preserving a relationship or keeping one's a person safe mm -hmm. or um, lots of reasons. Yeah. Feeling valued. Yeah. Feeling loved. Yeah. Connection. Yeah. Connection. connection. And also just what we see in media too. I think it's only been in the last five or 10 years that 
you're starting to see that in movies, whereas you would see a lot of enduring by the femme. Oh my gosh, I grew up in the 80s when every (laughs) single movie had a sex scene where she says no and then they're having sex, right? So also, did no mean that like no meant something else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a great point. And that's why, you know, I say recovering people pleaser because that's what I agree. It wasn't just deeply rooted family trauma. There was like, it was all around the world that I saw growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And when I'm working with clients and we're going over the wheel of consent, this is why I also find it really valuable to bring in like the muddy waters or the shadow side, because just as much of like groping and sexual assault is outside of the wheel of consent, so is being a people pleaser or a martyr or enduring. Like it's not seen as the most negative is that like but it is being outside of consent because you're outside of consent in your body Mm. yeah that's right Mm. I think of sometimes as these are are fabulously maladaptive strategies for attachment and belonging right yes (laughs) yeah (laughs) we've lived in relationships in a lot of ways and uh, you know as an adult to kind of come to this experience of like oh I don't have to be a people pleaser in order to be in relationship or be in belonging or have a secure attachment. Mm-hmm. I think one of the gifts that the wheel, of, the practices of the wheel of consent gives us is it gives us these opportunities to actually learn and experience that in our bodies in, in small containers. Yeah. I think that, yeah. And also with somebody who isn't like, if you're working one-on-one with somebody like us, with somebody who's not a lover Mm -hmm. it can and it feels I want to say more empowering to practice that on your own and discover that and on your own and then be able to take it into your life Mm -hmm. slowly and in a pace that feels comfortable to you that's right yeah I remember too learning something about desire smuggling Mm. This is something that, you know, I might have a client who's like, I want to try this with one of my lovers, or I want a threesome, or I want to try X, Y, Z. And, but they're really afraid of asking for what, so almost the opposite of a people pleaser, but like, oh, I had this dream about a threesome and I found it really hot. And then just leave it at that you know, see the reaction and engage. If you can smuggle that little desire into their domain. <laughs> I kind of explained what desire smuggling is, but like, why can that be? I don't want to say harmful, but like not a good, I don't know, not a good thing to have in your relationship. Again, I think it like going back to sort of like these uh, st- adaptive strategies, you know, there's lots of good reasons why asking very directly and very clearly for what I want, especially sexually or in- intimately in relationships can be quite scary. Or, you know, there, there are lots of reasons why I might hear a no, I might feel rejected, I might be judged, right? Like all these reasons why. And so one of the kind of sneaky ways that sometimes collectively we we might get around that is rather than directly and clearly asking for what I want uh, from someone else is to try and make them want it. Yes. <laughs> you explained that way more eloquently than I did. <laughs> and as somebody who's been on the recipient side of that, it doesn't feel so good. No. Right, I might find myself kind of going along with something or tolerating or enduring something. I wait, I didn't actually want this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know how we work with that as somatic sex educators is we train our clients on how to ask for what they want directly. And, and we start really simple with this language of there's two ways to ask for what you want. May I or will you? And those are two very um, direct ways 
to, to very specifically ask for a desire or to state a preference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I start that really early because I don't have a booking calendar. So the mm-hmm. negotiation with cl- people who want to work with me or current clients is, well, when do you want it? What works best for you? And they're like, oh, like Saturdays work good. I'm like, great. I have one slot open on this Saturday. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Is there a different Saturday? And if not, oh, I'm booked up that Saturday. Is there a second option for you? And like, I'm like, that's when the work starts Uh (laughs) with asking for what you want. That's right. And these are the tools of negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's that do start right. I mean, we're always sort of negotiating with with others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And practicing hearing a no too, because I might say, uh, no, I can't do it that day. Like I'm booked up for the next three weekends. And I'm like, that's when it starts. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure that your clients are, learn a lot immediately about you, which is you have good boundaries, right? Like, you know what your limits are and you're going to communicate those. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's pretty important to me to, to show up in that and I, I'm not me or model that immediately to the people that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because the wheel of consent is like, so it's changed how I've lived my life. And it's so powerful for me. And it's definitely something that I include in every client that I work with. And some of them love it and they just want more. And some of them are like, meh. And if it's a meh, then we navigate it in different terms, you know? Yeah. Also, there is a difference between getting permission and receiving consent. Hmm. Like permission, I see as more of like the yes, no binary, whereas consent is that negotiation of an agreement together. Mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say about that, but that was something I wrote down in my notes that I thought was important at the time. Well, what I hear in what you just said is um, something that that brings up for me the the idea of the spectrum of response that we use that also comes from Coco, our colleague, Kareen Diachuk, that there's, you know, not just a binary of yes and no, there's sometimes so many flavors in between. And that negotiation, those flavors in between relate to that in negotiation. So I might be a yes, I want that. But I have to negotiate also some limits. Yes, I'm available to connect intimately or sexually tonight. And here's what I'm working with in my body today. And so here's what I'm available for or what I'm not available for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or I'm a no. I'm a no to something, but ask me for something else. Or I'm a no to that, but here's something I would like, right? Mm -hmm. It gives us more opportunities to stay in connection and to negotiate some fabulous intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Staying in connection. I think that's like the big thing there Mm -hmm. because trying to get permission from somebody feels less connective than coming to an agreement together. And I think that also can equate to being a more attentive and conscious more what is the word I'm looking for (laughs) I'm struggling today with words Katie (laughs) it's Monday (laughs) yeah it's more nuanced and it's more relational I think yeah yeah. I mean some consent is about permission of course and I think of like an old model of of um you know like gatekeeper model of sex where one person has the sex and the other person's trying to get the sex and it's just about getting permission oh my god for it you know and it's like that you know like we're past that <laughs> yes oh my gosh and that brings me to lifestyle events and they're like a yes is a yes and a no is a no ask first and i'm like but it's not just about permission yes oh my god <laughs> that's right <laughs> And that kind of yes is a yes and no is a no kind of relates to that more gatekeeper model. And and we want more nuanced conversations. Yeah. That sounds like, here's something I want. Is that something you want also? Or what would you like, right? Like the conversation is very different than just a yes is a yes and a no and a no is a no. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why I 
admire the kink community and because they have such a higher level of negotiating and creating agreements, even contracts together in what they want to experience, what they're available for, what they don't want. And in some ways, I wish that that could be dropped into like the lifestyle community that I've had experiences in and maybe not to the same level because I've heard it can be very non-sexy, but then I feel like that sets you up for having a sexier and more fulfilling time with other, other people. Mm -hmm. (sighs) So much work to do so much, (laughs) so little time. (laughs) I always think consent is sexy, but I, I definitely have also heard, you know, people say, well, that level of conversation and negotiation can kind of kill the mood. And, and I think when I hear people say that, I think they haven't actually experienced sexy consent communication because it can be not only, I mean, I think that it inherently that level of negotiation creates, can create greater safety and trust. And I feel like what's possible in a container of greater safety and trust is like incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting with that for a second. That's exactly what it does. And it helps your body just like you don't experience the anxiety as much as what I experienced before because everybody was just looking for the yes or the no and I felt like I had to say yes because I was already there in that moment and it was hard to say no and they were just trying to get permission so that they didn't feel badly about going forward about something oh gosh (laughs) I think for that just makes for a lot of mediocre sex yes for everyone yeah Hmm. are you open to answering some instagram questions that i received sure okay question number one is loaded (laughs) (laughs) love it how do i begin setting boundaries when i've never set one before oh that's a good question it is a great question i think i actually really love that question because I think it relates exactly where where we started here today and what you guided us with, Tara, which was listening for our yes and listening for our no's. Because I often think when people say, I don't have any boundaries or I don't know how to have boundaries or how do I have better boundaries, I think of that as someone also saying, how do I learn to listen and notice what my body's telling me and then and be able to communicate that and then learn how to communicate it mm, yeah it's practice it's practice it absolutely is practice and it's practice listening to the for the no mm-hmm. and recognizing it and getting comfortable with different ways of expressing it I mean there's so many ways to express a no yeah and sometimes starting like really out there so One example is this Dom that I know, and he's like, yeah, if I'm like negotiating what a scene is going to look like. So a scene being a container set up between people that are going to be doing some sort of kink together. He's like, if if the sub or the person I'm playing with says, I don't have any boundaries, I'm okay with anything. He's like, so I ask them, like, are you okay with me, like, getting out my knife and cutting off your fingers? And he, and they're like, no, not at all. And he's like, hey, great. We have one boundary. Let's <laughs> right. keep going. <laughs> totally. So so um, the practice there can be just practicing setting limits, really, like, a stop, you know, because we all have limits. Like, I'm okay with that, but only for 10 minutes. Or, yes, you can do that, but only in this area right? Like just get, get really, you know, comfortable setting limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one practice that Rhea, so I work with Rhea with clients, we've done quite a few sessions together now. One thing we really like to involve is the yes, no authentic response. Mm -hmm. So we have like three questions and the first round it's saying yes to all of them. Mm -hmm. And then the same questions we ask the client to say no. And just noticing the difference between 
What does it mean, feel like to say yes to something that you want to say no to? And what does it feel to say no to something that you know is a yes? Mm -hmm. And then we give them the chance to authentically respond. And it seems like such a simple exercise, but it there's so much wisdom in that. And that can help start the process of boundary building and noticing where your boundaries and limits are. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What fun practice. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's nice because when we're working together, we can demo mm -hmm. together. So Rhea will ask me the questions and then the client just watches that. And even to witness something like that is very valuable for them. Yes. And then they get to choose who's going to ask them the questions and they choose and then we do it with them. And yeah, it's it's very powerful. And, and we learn a lot about the client in that little assessment piece. I bet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, you're probably doing this, you know, at the beginning of a session or early on in your work with a client, close on, right? You're doing yeah. it a playful way of learning and, and getting to know each other. Yeah. One of my favorite ones is, are you open? Will you come to my house after the session and deep clean it? <laughs> <laughs> then, then they ever, really know. <laughs> have you ever had an authentic yes to that question? <laughs> mm, it got a little muddy with one person because they're like, well, I really like cleaning. I'm like, but do you really want to do this after a session? Like, let's sink into this and they're like I don't know and I'm like okay well we can leave it as maybe <laughs> but only once mm -hmm. <laughs> out of the many many times that I've played this game mm -hmm. <sighs> okay I have a second question okay I am interested in being non-monogamous but my wife is not what should I do hmm that might be more of a question for you Tara than it is for me <laughs> Yeah, this is your area expertise. I feel like there's not enough information in that sentence for me to like really dissect what's going on here. Yeah. Like, have you desire smuggled or have you been like very open in the request? We can think of this question actually as not necessarily about non monogamy like anything related to somebody wants something in a relationship that right. somebody else doesn't, right? Like that's so common. Yeah, it could be, I want to watch my wife masturbate. Right. I want to play with her rosebud. Totally. <laughs> like, yeah. These are all common things I've heard. Yes, right? So this is this is a really common question kind of generally. Yeah, and... I think this is a really great example of where the spectrum of response can come into play. Yeah. Like, regardless of what it is, is it a definite no for your partner? Or do they want to, are they just not, do they not know enough about it? Right. Are there certain limits that perhaps need to be in place? Are they open to going to a sex club, but not doing anything with anyone? Mm -hmm. And having really hot sex when you come home. Yeah. Like what, and I, this is probably a whole session that I would work with a client. Yeah. Or with, as the, with the couple in negotiating this and just learning more about each other. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm thinking about it right now. I would probably do one session with each of them, introducing them to the wheel of consent and then bring them together mm -hmm. in a place where they can negotiate that and talk about it a little bit more deeply and embod in an embodied way together. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I would probably work with a couple around really understanding the difference between wanting versus willing versus tolerating or going along. Mm -hmm. And again, this is inherent in all relationships in, in many different ways, not just with sex, that there are times when our partners might want something that we don't. And be showing up in a willing way for them is a fabulous way to be in relationship at times, right? If we find ourselves always in that setting ourselves aside and showing up for a partner, there's probably going to end up being resentment. But to learn how to do that really within our own limits and integrity with ourselves is fabulous. And so we might show up for our partner's wants, desires, kinks, 
you know, and tracking our willingness to be there and also tracking that we're not kind of tolerating or enduring or feeling a no about it, right? When we're a no, we're a no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think that's where I think it can create more possibilities. And just like you said, like establishing limits can be one of the fabulous ways to create so many more possibilities. And around non-monogamy, where one partner wants to be in an open relationship and the other person doesn't, it can, there can be lots of limits around it, right? To make it, to make that kind of scenario have lots of possibilities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, what does that look like to you? Yeah. Like <laughs> there's a spectrum of non-monogamy too. Totally. Does it mean that you're going to have other partners completely? Does it mean that you're just going to go to like sexy resorts, like hedonism or desire? Like, what does that look like to you? And yeah. the fabulous thing about the non-monogamous open relationship partnerships is that you can choose. There isn't like, even though I, I know a lot of people feel pressured to like fit this little box of what non-monogamy is. It's so messed up that we have a little box because yeah. it's out of the box and then we just go into another box. <laughs> but <laughs> But you make it what works for you and what feels safe enough to you. And stay in connection with your body and with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Last question. I believe smoking cannabis before a scene, sex scene, takes the same part out of playing or getting intimate. Would you agree? I, is, I think maybe the, this question is referencing a model of consent safe, sane, and consensual, which is really common in the kink world. And it's possible, maybe this question is asking if I'm altered in any way, maybe cannabis or alcohol or any other kind of altered state, is it still, am I still maybe have full faculty to be able to consent? Yeah. That's kind of the gist I got from it too. What you're, yeah. Mm -hmm. Such a good question. And I would say, like, my response to that would be, it depends. I mean, our bot in erotic states, our bodies are altered. And so even without adding substances, right, once we, once the oxytocin is flowing, and maybe adrenaline or excitement, right, all these things can alter and impair our judgment. And so I think with new partners or new relationships, or you're in a setting where you're having experience with somebody that you don't have trust and safety built, that the negotiation ahead of time can be really valuable. So even if the negotiation is tomorrow night, we're going to get together, we're going to get into, you know, we're going to smoke cannabis or imbibe and here's what's okay and what's not okay. Like do that negotiation ahead of time and then stick with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, so in once we're in altered states, uh, we often say no up negotiation, like we can down negotiation, but not up a, a negotiation. So if we had negotiated before we went into the altered state that we weren't going to say have penetration, but we were going to include all these other fabulous things. Once we're in altered states, we might be like, oh, let's bring in the penetration. The, and, you know, to, to really honor and be respectful to the negotiation ahead of time and say, that's fabulous. It's fabulous that we have this desire but let's wait to renegotiate when we're not altered. Yes. Yeah, that's what I had in my mind. I volunteered to bottom for a impact play workshop and the person teaching it started the negotiation with me, well, a month out and then checked in two weeks before and then a week before, all in un unaltered states. And then during the class, people were invited to bring toys or impact play items and at first she's like oh I can show you how to use it and she looks at me and she's like no I can't we didn't communicate this we didn't have a conversation or negotiation about this I can and Tara's in in subspace right now she cannot have informed consent and and true authentic consent from her body right now. So she made that decision for me because that was something that we didn't talk about beforehand. And I felt good about that. I felt very taken care of in that state. Amazing. 
Yes. Wow. I'm so, glad, I'm so glad you had that experience. Yeah. So somebody was hold like recognizing that you weren't maybe you were in an altered state, your consent would be, you know, influenced in that moment by your state and your ability to choose. And they were really protecting that uh, and honoring the integrity of what had been negotiated or hadn't been negotiated ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And I felt really cared for and listened to and valued in the vulnerable state that I was. And so when I bought him again uh, in November, I'm like really looking forward to it. I don't, yeah. I don't feel that anxiety, you know, like I feel excited and that I will be taken care of and that that negotiation ahead of time trumps all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there will be no up negotiating. And yeah, just that feels good. And it makes the next time more exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it does acknowledge that sometimes, you know, things don't, you know, it's like there, there can be bumps and things don't, you know, we, you know, like in hindsight, oh, we should have done that. Right. Like there are accidents that happen and there are ways that we maybe didn't know we needed to have these negotiations ahead of time. And I think part of like having those tools, even afterwards, as we're maybe cleaning up something that felt kind of messy in the moment can be really helpful to kind of help dissect, like, why didn't that feel good? Oh, it didn't feel good because I was altered and I didn't have the ability to consent, right? Like these tools can be very useful in the repair conversations around consent mm -hmm. and the thinking through what could we have done differently. The ouchies and oopsies. Right. <laughs> That's right. Because they happen. Come on. Yeah. 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 We can't be expected to be perfect. We're just playing into that societal pressure that we can't fuck up and that we have right. to be perfect and that's just bogus <laughs> we're humans we're meant to make some mistakes <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you katie so much for coming on and doing this i have wanted to do this particular episode for a long time so thank you from the bottom of my heart for showing up today you're so welcome what a pleasure to be here and be in this conversation with you I'm curious how folks listening can find you if they want to learn more about what you do. Sure. Probably the best way to find me is through my website, since I'm not on most social media. Uh, my website is sacredwombservices.com. And I teach wheel of online wheel of consent classes that might be uh, maybe most useful to your particular audience. Um, and have a class coming up in December of 2023 which is uh, really leading into these practices that we just talked to, we spent the last hour talking about learning how to notice our yes and no's and negotiate and ask for what we want. So that's uh, where you can find information on that class. On your website. Yeah. Perfect. Everybody go check that out. Pronto. <laughs> all right. And thank you to all of the folks tuning in today and listening to the show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access information, I invite you to get social. You can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at sexed for the modern bed. Until next time, claim your pleasure, own your body, and stay in presence. Mm -hmm.